I'm going to begin with two different scenarios, two different situations in my life where I saw somebody under pressure responding. The first was right after the United States went to war for the second time with Iraq. Uh, there, we, we, Amy and I lived here in Fort Collins, and there was kind of an atmosphere of, hey, what's happening in our What's happening in our nation? And I mean, it was, it was war. we're at war. And uh, it was the first time in my adult life that, that I really felt the, it was the whole shock and awe. Like it, was, like it was on TV, we're watching Baghdad being bombed, and it was a big deal. And one night, our, I, I think it was our small group, or maybe it was a college group, was all meeting at our house down in the basement of this house, and my landlord lived upstairs. And suddenly, we hear this commotion outside. We hear running down the stairs, bang, bang, bang on the door. He throws open the door, and it's my landlord. And he says, I don't know what's going on outside, but something crazy is happening. He's totally flipping out. So we're like, okay. Uh, he said, I think we've been bombed because we had seen fire. In the so, we go, I, so, this, so he is freaking out. And so we say, okay, well, me and I think Matt Moorhead, my friend Matt Moorhead, we went outside and the whole eastern horizon is just glowing and moving like some great fire, like huge fire is out on the eastern horizon. Well, it turns out it was just like a blown gas pipe out in Timnath or something. But it, 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 was, it was huge. It was like lighting up the sky. Um, but that was my landlord's response under pressure. He totally flipped out. Now, a few years before that, different scenario. I'm at Eastern New Mexico University with Justin and, and uh, Ashley and a bunch of other friends. And uh, one night, one of the football players in kind of a drunken stupor and, uh, and in a rage punched through a window and lacerated his bicep and was bleeding everywhere. And our friend Tim, who was in the Air Force, was like, I am trained for this. Totally calm. He, he stops or he gets the bleeding under control. He's like, somebody call 911. He's shouting out commands. He is totally composed in the situation. And I mean, just rocked it. <laughs> and it really stood out to me as, as a, a, an impressive demonstration of how somebody ought to keep composure under pressure. There's something really inspiring, very impressive about somebody who doesn't totally flip out, but knows what to do under pressure and performs well. And so I want you to see tonight, as we look at the early church under pressure, how composed they are in one sense. They're very composed. They know just what to do when the pressure hits. And that's what we're going to look at as we continue through the book of Acts. We are in chapter 4. So if you've got your Bibles, please open up to Acts chapter 4. We'll be starting in verse 23. And in fact, I'm just going to go ahead and read the whole passage as we get going. Acts chapter 4. starting in verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon the threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. 
Let me give you a little bit of context for those of you who haven't been with us and just to get the rest of us kind of up to speed. In chapter 3, Peter and John go to the temple at the hour of prayer, and on their way way in, they heal a crippled man, a man who has not been able to walk for 40 years. Something's wrong with his ankles and his feet. They heal him, and following the healing, Peter preaches a sermon to all the people in the temple who have uh, witnessed what's happened. The authorities show up, and this is what we talked about last week, they show up, and, and, and when I say the authorities, I mean the religious leaders, they arrive at the beginning of chapter 4, and they're annoyed because Peter and John are teaching that in Jesus uh, there is resurrection. And among those uh, authorities are the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection, and so they, they're annoyed at what they're teaching, and they have Peter and John arrested. Meanwhile, 5,000 people have come to faith in Jesus as a result of the healing and the sermon that Peter preaches afterwards. Peter and John are placed under arrest. They are held overnight. The next day they appear before the Sanhedrin and they're questioned about the healing. And and during the questioning, Peter uh, is filled with the Spirit and he says that this healing happened in the name of Jesus and by the power of the name of Jesus. And by the way, that name not only heals crippled feet, but That name is the only name under heaven whereby we can be saved. So there's power in this name, both for physical healing and there's power in this name for eternal healing. Well, after the Sanhedrin discusses the situation and realizes that they're kind of trapped because they can't deny the miracle because the crippled man is is standing right there, they say, well, we're just going to forbid you to speak or to teach at all in the name of of Jesus, verse 18, chapter 4, verse 18. So, so here, here's what's going on. Um, these guys realize that they have to silence these Christians. They, these guys can't talk about this Jesus. Now remember, in chapter 1, verse 8, the Holy Spirit is given to the church specifically for the purpose of empowering the church to bear witness. Their job, the church's job, is to talk about Jesus. And the religious authorities is, are, are clued into the fact that speaking about Jesus, both healing in his name and preaching about the resurrection, is what's causing all this activity. So they're trying to shut down the religion. The Sanhedrin is trying to shut down what they see as the vehicle through which all the commotion is being stirred. We got to keep them silent. And the Sanhedrin at this point doesn't realize that they are in direct opposition, of course, to what God has commanded the disciples to do. You guys need to speak. The Sanhedrin is saying, you can't speak, right? So there's a tension over that very issue. And so with threats, they finally release them. And that's where we come to our text today. Peter and John go back now and they report to the church the situation. They tell the church what the Sanhedrin has told them. And we'll start, we're just going to walk through the passage starting in verse 23. When they were released, when Peter and John were released, They went to their friends, uh, the church community, and they reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them, right? These guys told us that we can't speak or teach in the name of Jesus. They they told us to disobey Jesus. Now, here's what I want to point out. This is the the pressurized situation that uh, the church is placed in, and what we want to look at today is how does the church respond to that pressurized situation? Jesus said, teach. The people who killed Jesus said we're not allowed to. That's pressure, right? How do they respond? Well, I would say they're very composed, Acts 4.24, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. Okay, that's the first piece of the composure. Here's their knee-jerk reaction under pressure is they go... Straight to God. They pray. That's, that's, the, that's their instinct. That's, that's all that they know to do. And it's the right thing to do, of course. The church prays. And I think we can learn from that. You know, it, what, what's our knee-jerk reaction? Think about your week this week. Any pressure? What was your knee-jerk reaction? What tends to be your knee-jerk reaction under pressure? Do you know this about yourself? Are you self-aware enough to know what do I tend to do under pressure? Do I get anxious? 
Do I complain? Uh, do I blame? Do I get controlling? Do I start processing? What do you do? I start processing. I, I start thinking and talking and processing and thinking. And I don't know if I ever get to prayer sometimes. <laughs> right? What do you do? What's your tendency? Under pressure. Do you lift your voice to God? The church did. The church did, and God responds. So I want to look at this scene. I want to look at this prayer. The bulk, the bulk of the time is, is actually looking at the prayer itself, the prayer of, of, of a church under threat from the religious authorities who have commanded them to disobey Jesus by remaining silent. Now, most of the prayer is not a request. Most of the pr- prayer is a, is a prolonged, worshipful, introductory, dear God. They, 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 they linger over the God whom they are addressing. If, if I could illustrate it, it would be something like, like this. Dear God, our Father, the one who reigns in heaven, who's seated above all other powers, you are in control. You are ever faithful. You never fail. You are our King, and we put our trust in you because you look upon those who fear you. It's a, a, it's a prolonged introductory, dear God. Does that make sense? That's how this prayer feels. And so most of the prayer, most of the prayer is not the request. They get to a request at the very end. Most of the prayer is just lingering over who God is. So let's, let's walk through this. Starting in verse 24, when they heard it, when the church heard about what the Sanhedrin said to John and Peter, they lifted their voices together to God and said, and here we go into the prayer, Sovereign Lord. Notice that the, that the, that the prayer here is beginning with the idea of the sovereignty of God, the absolute control, total power of God over all things. Sovereign Lord, who made... I'm just going to keep on talking about this sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. He, he is the sovereign one, the all-powerful one, the one over all other powers, and he's the maker. He made what you see up there, and he made this what you see here, and he made the ocean, and he made everything in them. Right? He's, he's the maker of all things. That's who we're talking to right now. The prayer lingers here over the identity of God as creator. Now, this God of creation, despite the fact that he is the sovereign one, he has sovereign power, and he's the one who's made all things, this God is nevertheless the same God whom David said the nations rage against. That's what happens next in verse 25. Sovereign God, Creator, verse 25, who, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, here's what David said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed. Back in Psalm chapter 2, David wrote this. And David uh, recognizes that the nations and their rulers have a particular posture with regards to God. And it doesn't tend to be a posture of humility. It doesn't tend to be a posture of submission and honor. The tendency of the nations and the tendency of the rulers of the nations is to have an attitude of defiance and even to team up and resist and bring assault against God and against His anointed. Now, when David talks about God's anointed in Psalm chapter 2, who is he referring to? He's referring to himself. David 
is God's anointed. He is the king of Israel. He sits anointed as king on the throne of Israel, reigning over the kingdom of God on earth. And what David is realizing is that God, who is king over all things and who has put me on the throne, there are these nations who rage against you and your anointed. People are going to war with David. They are against him. They don't even realize that I'm God's appointed king. I'm God's king. Like, not over God, but belonging to God. (laughs) But the church here, as they're praying, they're thinking back. As they think about the sovereign Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, it's the same God who spoke through David when David recognized that the nations fight against God. And that instance where David recognizes that sets a pattern that the church recognizes. The pattern is a foreshadow of how the world is going to treat God and the final anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And that's where their prayer goes next. The the, the church is praying, we remember what David recognized, that the nations fight against you, God, and your anointed. And in our days, that pattern has come to fruition with regards to your anointed Messiah. This is what happens, verse 27. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. See that? There's the, there's the resemblance. Just as the nations gathered together against David, the anointed one, the nations have in our day gathered against Jesus, the anointed one. And then he talks about who the nations are, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and plan had predestined to take place. Now, what, what, what the church is, is recognizing here that there, is that there was a multi-ethnic, multinational assault against the Messiah. And it consisted of all nations and their rulers. Herod, who was king of the Jews. He was only half Jewish, but he was regarded as the king of the Jews. Pontius Pilate was the ruling governor in Judea. And the Gentiles the Roman soldiers, and the people of Israel. Everybody's guilty. There's nobody who gets off the the hook. Jews and Gentiles and their rulers put Jesus to death. Now, before getting to the request, this introductory address kind of circles back to where it began with this idea that God is sovereign. He's in control of everything. These nations and their leaders gathered together just like they did against David. They gathered together against your anointed one, Jesus, verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your plan predestined to take place. That's very strong language, and we have to think about it for a second. The murder of Jesus, the most innocent human being who ever has and ever will live, the most perfect human who ever has and ever will live, was murdered, Jesus was murdered by Pontius Pilate, the people pleaser, and Joseph Caiaphas, who was jealous because the crowds loved Jesus. This Jesus was murdered by the Jewish crowd who called out for the release of Barabbas, the murderer and insurrectionist. This Jesus was murdered by the Roman soldiers, the Gentiles, who drove nails into his flesh and executed him by suffocation on a cross, finishing their sadistic duty by impaling him through the heart. This murder of Jesus and every depraved decision and every heinous action that occurred in the murderous events of the crucifixion of God's Son was predestined to take place by God. That needs to land. God planned it, and God determined and ensured that it would be so. It took place just as He had planned. 
God did not perform it. His hand was not guilty in the least, but somehow he determined that it would occur. He is the sovereign Lord. That's where the prayer began. And it ends with this statement of he's so sovereign that this was all according to the predetermined plan of God. He's the maker of the heavens. He's the maker of the earth. He's the maker of the sea. He is the maker of all that is in those things. And there is never a moment when things are so dark. There is never a moment when things are so violent. There is never a moment when things are so chaotic and disturbing and evil that God has left the building. He is always on the throne. And no matter how the nations rage, because that's the point, No matter how crazy it seems, God is always in charge of the situation and he has something in mind that he is accomplishing. And if you ever doubt that, I want you to remember that the most evil act that the world has ever witnessed was ironically God's plan for saving the world. Don't ever forget that. There is no evil that you will ever face that is more evil than what took place here. And he planned it for good. I don't know how he does that. I can't answer all the philosophical questions that come up with that. I'm just saying this is what the Bible says. When you pray to God in your very darkest trial, in the most pressurized situation you could ever imagine yourself in and it hurts like the flames of hell on the earth and you are under pressure do you maintain your composure and talk to God like he's a big God because that's what they're doing they're talking to him like he's big right like they really believe that he's in control here Do you talk to him like he's the sovereign Lord, like he's the maker of all things? Do you talk to him like he's a God who has a plan so perfectly executed that even crucifixion, and if crucifixion, how much more this situation that I am in, even crucifixion can be turned for good? Do you pray to him like that? Is that the kind of God that you address when you're under pressure? That's what I mean when I say the church maintains composure. They like don't forget who their God is. That's how this church was praying when they faced threats from the leaders of the Jewish nation and the court system that had murdered Jesus in recent days. That's how they prayed when they had to decide whether they're going to obey Jesus or whether we're going to obey the courts, knowing that if we obey Jesus, somebody's probably going to die, and people did die. They prayed to a big God under pressure. That's composure. I'm not saying they weren't scared. I'm not saying they weren't wondering what was going to happen. I'm saying they didn't forget how big God was in the situation. And their knee-jerk reaction was to go to him and to talk to him about who he is and to linger in his identity for a moment because the, the mind needs that. Our minds need times of prayer where we are lingering over how great God is so that we don't lose our mind in the middle of pressurized situations. That's praying with composure. They spend most of their time in this prayer communicating and declaring to God things about Him that were reassuring to themselves in the pressurized situation. They were praying to a God who is watching over everything and He makes worlds and He makes seas and He makes people and He makes nations that rage. And when they rage, He's still in control. That's the God that they're praying to. And it's to this God having now lingered over his identity, it's to this God that they bring now two requests. Two requests. And, and, and mindful that they're talking to a God that they think can actually do something, right? Because they've just re- renewed their mind with the reality of who he is. Two requests. The first one is in verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. There are actually kind of two things packed in there. Um, They ask God to consider the situation, and they ask God to help them obey, right? Look look down on what's happening here. Please be mindful of the pressurized situation that we're in, and 
Will you give us boldness, please, to do what you called us to do, namely declare your word, to testify to Jesus. We don't want to crack under this pressure. Strengthen us for faithfulness. The first thing that they're praying for is strength for faithfulness. Interesting that they're not mainly focused on, hey, would you remove the pressure? No, would you help us to remain faithful under pressure? Right? That's what they're asking for. The second thing that they ask is in verse 30. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Like, like, please allow the message that we're declaring to be attended with heavenly power in the form of healing and signs and wonders. Please, Lord, bring them. I mean, they're really shamelessly asking for healing and signs and wonders because, remember, it was the healing of the crippled man that opened up the opportunity to preach the gospel that resulted in 5,000 people coming to Jesus. So this power alongside the proclamation has been a part of the recipe from the very beginning of their ministry. And so what they're asking is that God would continue to please give us the full recipe Help us to proclaim faithfully and let it be attended with a a real sense of your presence in power so that what we have to say really impacts people. Does that make sense? Those are the two things that they're asking for. And we need those two things as well. I think this topic keeps coming up for Choice City. One, because I chose to go through Acts because I wanted to talk about these things. And two, because I think God wants this in our church, and I think he wants us to seek it. I think God wants us to seek this kind of reality. Give us strength to be faithful to the preaching of the word and give us power from heaven to attend the preaching of your word, right? We want to be a gospel-centered church with solid content and thoughtful, careful, bold engagement with and proclamation of the word of God and We want the God that we are talking about to be evident, obvious, notable, apparent, visible, perceptive in his presence with us. So we speak of great deeds and the beauty of a God who is here, right? Our city is full of broken people, for sure. We were just talking today at lunch. There's a a high level, for some reason, in this Rocky Mountain paradise, a high level of suicide. Like, people are not finding what they're looking for. And we have a message about a God who did something and who is here. And if all, if all the ministry of Choice City Church is, we're going to tell you about a God who did something, but there's not really a sense that he's present, I'm just not anticipating that there's going to be a great flocking to him because people aren't looking for good ideas. They're looking for answers that make a difference in their life. And they've looked here, and they've looked here, and they've looked here, and they've looked here, 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 here. It's nowhere. Suicide. And if they look to what we have to offer, it's just good ideas that doesn't impact. There's no power. There's no evidence that the God we speak of is actually God. Then it's weak. It falls flat. Now, God's word never comes back void. You know why? Because he brings power to attend it. And that's what I'm saying this church was praying for. And we need to pray for it. Unashamedly pray for it. I want power. I want power, power. Holy Spirit, I want to feel your presence. Move. Do something. Heal somebody. Give me a dream. Give me a sign. Do something. Take away Amy's Lyme disease. Do something, Lord, please. And if you don't, then do something else. And if not that, then something else. But I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask, ask, ask. Because our God is not merely a God of concepts. He's a God of both the good news and he's a God of presence. 
Well, God responds to this prayer, and he responds in a way that I think we all wish he would always respond to every prayer of ours. He shows up in a really big way, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. No? Okay. (laughs) And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Answer, answer, answer. Three things. One, as the prayer ends, the church is given a physical experience. The building literally shakes. God did something to make it very clear that he intends to answer their prayer for his presence to arrive in power. Will you stretch out your hand and heal God? And will you allow signs and wonders to be performed in the name of your servant Jesus? What's the answer? Yes, I will. It's a sign that he heard. And yeah, you better believe I'm coming in power. Earthquake, you know. That's the first thing that happens. Here's the second thing that happens. The church is freshly filled with the Spirit. We talked about this last week, but let me just quickly review. There, you have to have these two categories when it comes to your experience with the Holy Spirit. The first one is this. Every single Christian, the moment they actually understand the gospel and believe in it, they are sealed with the Holy Spirit for eternity as a down payment of the inheritance that is on its way. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 talks about believing and being sealed with the uh, down payment, with the, with the deposit of what's to come. There's a second kind of experience that Christians can have that are subsequent experience of the Spirit's presence, here, be, here referred to as being filled with the Spirit. This day, after they prayed, something happened with regards to the Holy Spirit called being filled with the Spirit. There was some sort of sensation or experience or, or notable uh, awareness that God has just answered in a huge way. He's here. I'm filled right now. And it could come in the form of joy, peace, uh, things that feel like physical sensations sometimes. I mean, it could, look a lo- it could look a lot of different ways. We see this throughout the book of Acts. In chapter 2, Peter is filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And then this is what happens when people are filled with the Spirit and they do, they do ministry and it's effective ministry. So Peter is filled with the Spirit. In chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, he preaches a sermon. 3,000 people come to Jesus. We saw last week in chapter 4, verse 8, Peter is, quote, filled with the Spirit, and then he preaches to the Sanhedrin. It leaves them astonished and aware that this man has spent some time with Jesus. I mean, the Sanhedrin is blown away. It happens again in Acts chapter 7, in verse 55. Stephen is, quote, full of the Holy Spirit. He declares that Jesus stands at the right hand of God, and he becomes the first martyr in Christian history. That martyr begins a persecution that spreads Christians all over the Greco-Roman Empire. And what do they take with them? The gospel. And there are several other examples we'll see as we go through the book of Acts. So being filled with the Spirit is an important component of effective ministry in the book of Acts, following this powerful time of prayer, the entire church has the experience. And there's a result from it. And it's the result that's always supposed to come from being filled with the Spirit. In verse 31, it says, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. Now remember, this is the first request. Will you help us to be faithful to speak your word boldly. God gives the Spirit, and what does it enable them to do? Be faithful to speak the word boldly. Right? The result of the prayer is that they're filled with the Spirit, and the result of being filled with the Spirit is the bold proclamation of the word of God or the gospel. Okay, four components of this example of prayer under pressure. Four components of this composed response that I think we can take away and say, okay, we're watching this early church. Here's what they did under pressure. One is that they prayed first. They prayed first. They had this knee-jerk reaction to go to prayer. I think it's a good reminder for all of us to, to um, 
uh, take a look at our own selves and say, hey, are, are we, are, do we have the tendency to go to God first? We ought to. We, we should develop this. Are we self-aware enough to know what we tend to do when we're under pressure? Right? When you feel pain, what do you tend to do? We were just talking the other night, Justin and Carrie and Amy and I, we were talking about how hurt people hurt people, right? When you feel pressure and pain, what do you tend to do? Well, let's tend to pray. Let's tend to pray. And when we pray, second thing, let's pray to a big God. Let's linger over the reality of who God is. Let's remember him. Let's not be like, dear God, request, 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 request. Here's what I want. Here's what I need, which is all good. But maybe before you do that, dear God, and when I say God, I mean God. I mean maker. I mean king. I mean sovereign. I mean you're in control. I mean I got these little things over here. No problem. You made all these things and all the things to conquer them. I'm talking to you. Let's learn to linger. Let's pray to a big God. Does that make sense? Number three, let's pray for boldness to speak. I think it's just really interesting that the prayer is focused more on help me be faithful than on get me out of this situation. Now, you can pray to get out of a situation. The psalmists do it all the time. Rescue me. Salvation is a theme in the Bible. You can ask for it. But so is faithfulness. And sometimes God doesn't remove us from pressurized situations. He calls us to faithfulness through them, right? So um, pray for faithfulness. And specifically, I think for our church, as we think of kind of the corporate uh, location that we are in this church's life, let's be a church of prayer. Let's be a church that has a big God and talks to a big God. And let's be a church that prays for boldness to speak the gospel. Let's pray for boldness to speak the gospel so that we're faithful. Even if we're under pressure, we're faithful. And then the fourth thing is let's pray for the power and the presence of God to be with us as we obey so that what we're doing isn't just lip service and what we're doing isn't just checklists and what we're doing isn't just going through the motions, but what we're doing is... uh, in alignment with a God who has a mission and who intends to work on the earth. Do big things, God. Do big things um, in my life. Do big things in my family. Do big things in my church. Do big things in my neighborhood. Show yourself to be present in ways that really blow people away. I mean, change lives, God. Really change lives. Do things that are undeniable. Do things that leave people who don't like Jesus saying, I don't know what to do about this. The dude is healed. Do that kind of stuff, God. Pray first. Pray to a big God. Pray for boldness to speak and be faithful. Pray for the power and the presence of God to be with us as we obey. And then the answer is up to him. How he answers those prayers, that's up to him. That's his, that's his business. Just let it not be the case that we have not because we ask not. 